comics code and like to the standards of the comics code while also trying to compete with, you know, Vampirella. Um, and I always found the sort of like how com how the comic versions tried to kind of titillate, um, how to how to compete with titillation while having their hands bound as opposed to like, and I love like the Vampirella comics were awesome, but it was essentially just a naked lady. Like right. that was why you were reading them is there's a naked lady who's a vampire dancing around. Um, and I think, you know, like the House of Mystery and House of Secrets specifically were a little, were like almost, they aspired to be classier because they had to. Right. Um, and it was also like, when you look at those books, like Mark Dematius wrote I Vampire. Like Mark, J.M. Dematius, who's one of the greatest writers in the history of comics, that was one of his first gigs. Like he just wrote, he was hired to write a vampire comic with sort of no, there wasn't any guidance given to him. You know, like just do something because people like vampires. What horror comics are out there now? Because it does seem like at least in the mainstream, superheroes are the genre. I mean, there's still, like Walking Dead is obviously the, yeah. is obviously the big one. Um, and I think, like, I feel like, like what I've found in writing horror comics is that there's less of a market for them than, than you would think. Right, um, and the the reason, the reason is that there's not you don't have the same toolbox that you do in in film or in TV. Um, horror, as a genre, functions entirely on uh, pacing, on sound design, right, and on uh, performance. Um, and in comics, the way we read comics, you can't. You literally can't do a jump scare, right? A jump scare is like the a jump scare is like the the um, the basic is like the 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 uh, basic unit of measure of a of a horror story, right? Is how do I get somebody to go, <gasps> right? Because that's what you doing that and progressively like crescendo is what how you get people to really click right. into something. In comics, you open the you get in a twenty page comic or twenty two page comic, the most you ever get is nine. Get nine jump scares because the only jump scare you get is when you flip a page, right? I was about to say that's the only surprise you have, and I've seen—I don't want to say bad writers and artists, but people whose surprise was in the last panel on the second page. It's like I've been staring at this out of the corner of my eye for the last it, yeah. three minutes. You know? Well, and that's the thing—is your brain processes all, your, whether it's a two-page spread or eighteen panels, your brain processes all the information as though it's one, as though it's a splash page. So you have to like the effort you have to put in to create something akin to a jump scare that's more than just that, that small number is crazy hard. I did a book um, a few years ago called Echoes that uh, I did with Rasan Ekdal. And uh, the thing that Rasan and I did is like we really talked at length about how do we combat that? Like how do we, how do we build in more scares than we're allowed, essentially, than, than the medium allows? And it was a ton of work, and I like I, I'm, I'm. It's probably my favorite thing, favorite comic I've ever done, because I think it's super effective. Um, but we did it with like, I mean, it nearly killed Razan. Like it was really, really hard because he's doing these, you know, thirty panel grids, so that there's so much density that you don't see. You literally can't see the scare because you don't understand what it is because there's not enough context right. until you get to it. Um, and it's doing sort of complicated stuff like that that I think is hard for people to read. <laughs> like it's, it's just functionally difficult for people to read that many panels or read sort of critically enough to, to get it. Um, so you end up, you know, and there's like, I'm good friends with Steve Niles, who's, you know, the other, him and Kirkman are sort of the two, the two pillars of, of horror and comics. And, you know, with Steve, Steve, goes in, you know, Steve would, I think, probably rather be doing jump scares, but so much of what he does is sort of in the more Sam Raimi, um, sort of like grotesque, like grotesquery, or sort of just the like situational horror almost, um, because that's, that's the horror that people can understand. You can be a little more nudge, nudge, wink, wink, um, because it's so incredibly hard and exhausting to actually get it out. So I think that's, I think that's a lot of it. I think that's a lot of the handicap. Uh, back on superheroes briefly, in 2013, you were assigned two Green Lantern titles at DC, <laughs> which is a high-profile and lucrative going, gig. You're going mean. Uh, I was going <laughs> to say, uh, but you, you, you quit before any of your stories could appear, and you described it as a toxic environment. It gave you migraines, was stressful. At the risk of making you relive this painful period of your life, <laughs> relive this painful period of your life for us. Um, and I only, I, I'm teasing a little bit, when, 
when guys grow up reading comics, um, it's often the dream. I want to go write for Marvel or DC. And I so often hear from people who do it who say, boy, that wasn't quite what I thought it was going to be. And I, I really don't want you to relive the stress, but that's fascinating to me. I mean, what, what, what happened there to the extent that it wasn't quite what you maybe had thought it was growing um, up? The Green Lantern thing's like a very, it was like an oddly specific to me situation. Uh, like the bigger question, um, what's happened in the past like 15 years in comics is as Marvel and DC have sort of become these corporate monoliths, essentially they're editorially, the, the comics are much more editorially driven, right? So you're being given kind of edicts which is fine because they're paying you to write it and it's their stuff. Um, but it's also, it's also has, to, but the, the, the other side of it is you also have to be able to make the choice. Um, what was hardest for me and why I eventually left the Green Lantern stuff is um, the way I, the way I've presented it to them is when people look at a, a comic, when you look at the cover of a comic, right? What's the biggest thing? The first thing you see, in theory, should be the title, mm -hmm. right? So the title is the priority. That's the most important thing. So if you're writing Superman, Superman is the most important thing about that book, right? The second biggest thing on a cover is the company logo. So, okay, so we're servicing DC Comics. We're writing the best Superman comic that DC Comics can put out. Then what is the third biggest thing on that cover? It's usually your name. So your name is the next word that people see. And specifically, not the artist's name, but the writer's name. They put the writer's name first. The thing is, is nobody, when people don't like a book, or when a book fails, whether it's the writer's fault or not, nobody is like, stupid DC, you made a bad book. Nobody's like, stupid Superman, you made a bad book. <laughs> but they go, stupid Josh, you made a bad book. And you, you sort of take the fall, but the reality is that the situa like it's situationally rare to have the authority at a comics company, at a work for hire comics company, to actually have that kind of power. There's guys who do. Brian Bendis has that power. You know, Grant Morrison has that power. Like there's there's certainly guys who have that level of authority. Um, and for me, like I'm I'm. Uh, it's funny because I have a I have a I have an employee. I have a factory worker mentality, as we were talking about. Like, I really genuinely believe, like, look, you're hiring me to build a chair. So you're, you're saying to me, we want you to build this Batman-shaped chair, right? And it can be the best Batman-shaped chair, but it still has to be Batman. Like, it still has to, at the end of the day, that chair has to look like Batman. Um, the problem comes when they're like, well, what if Batman was rainbow-colored? And you're like, well, okay, I mean... Like, okay, we'll, we'll do, like, a Batman of Zen or R. Like, that's kind of, you know, like, and you, you start, like, and then it eventually you get to a point where they're like, what if Batman was a robot with a cyborg brain? And you're like, well, that's not Batman. Like, you, you keep getting kind of pushed away from what, what the center is, right? You keep getting pushed away from what the core of the characters are and what they mean. Um, and it was very difficult to me. You know, I, I use Superman all the time because... Uh, I wrote, the first thing I wrote for DC was Batman, Batman, Superman, like the, the two top books, it's both of them, world's, like the world's finest equivalent. And uh, I'd never written anything before that when I told my mom I was writing it, she knew what it was. She was like, oh, Superman? You mean Clark Kent, Lois Lane? I was like, yeah. And then I said to her, who's, who's, who's Clark Kent's boss? And my 65-year-old South African mom goes, oh, it's Perry White. And I go, and who's this kid sidekick? She goes, oh, it's Jimmy Olsen. Like, she knows who it is. Like, the character is so ingrained in our culture that everybody kind of knows who he is and knows how important he is. And so, I, like, and I think there's an important level of guardianship over those characters. Um, and to that point, like, the stuff, the Green Lantern stuff, like, the super short version of it is, you know, I was given Jon Stewart to write. And Jon Stewart is, like, the most, I think, not, like, not trying to put them in any sort of order, but of all the characters in comics, specifically of all the black characters in comics, he is the most important. And he's the most important for, for two reasons. One is more people know him as Green Lantern than any other Green Lantern because of the cartoons. Super, like, so all these kids have grown up with that's Green Lantern. Number two, any kid on Earth 
any African American child the one superhero they can easily cosplay as, they can easily dress up as in Halloween, who they can walk into a store and not have to be Spider-Man with a mask over their face, the one character who they can walk in and not have somebody say, oh, it's black Batman, it's black Superman, to have them just be the character without a qualifier that narrows them down to a race. That one character is Jon Stewart because all they need is a Green Lantern costume. That's the important part. And what DC wanted to do was to get rid of them because they didn't understand the use of the character. And my point was like, I'm not, I'm not gonna be responsible for hurting, like it's, that's an aggressive act. It's an aggressive negative effect that you're having on an important character. Like let alone the fact that on top of that from like a historical standpoint, like Jon Stewart, Neil Adams created him, he created him specifically. He's been around 30, 35 years at that yeah, point. Yeah, and he, he represents something very important, I think, in, in comics in that he's an African-American character whose story is not tied to revenge, his story is not tied to violence, his character is not tied to the streets, like he's not tied directly to Africa, like Black Panther has all those things, but the whole thing is he's an African king and he's, you know, like, John Stewart's a soldier, an engineer, or an architect rather, sorry, uh, he is level-headed, he's thoughtful of all of the Green Lanterns, he is always portrayed as the one who is right. He's a good man. And to sort of essentially wipe him away for literally no reason was so like morally repugnant to me that I just couldn't, I couldn't do it and I presented all that to them like as these are the deals and I was told you have to kill him. Ed, uh, uh, Peter David was in here before you, and he was talking about how he had left books, uh, including books like The Hulk that he'd written for 12 years successfully because he'd get calls from his editor saying, I love what you're doing, now do it entirely differently. And it, it does surprise me. I can't picture a restaurant owner, for example, saying, hey, I got a dish that sells pretty well. I'm going to go tell the chef to dump another half cup of salt into it. Yeah. Um, I mean, if it's you know, selling it, well, then let it sell well. It's, you know, look, the, the, the creative arts are... Uh, <laughs> the creative arts are weird because you, especially as a writer, what we do is this invisible thing that everybody thinks they can do. Um, there was a poll done at some point of comic readers and they found that something like 70% of people who read comics want to make comics. And they don't want to be artists. They want to be writers. So people, people have Because no, anyone can write. It takes skill to draw. And you, and you know, like, no, as a journalist, like, that's yes. the thing. Is everybody thinks, like, well, what, any moron could do what you do. Um, I'm living proof. And then it's no, and, like, and you look and you get to you get to that that same attitude is true of editorial. It's true of producers. It's true of executives, and it's a thing that what I've learned in my career, having worked with hundreds of editors and hundreds of executives on different movies and TV shows and all that stuff, is that finding a producer who actually understands or finding an editor who actually understands that what you do is is magic that what you do is special and is actually a skill set, they're worth their weight in gold because they so rarely exist. And I don't even think that it's malicious. I don't think it's like purposefully ignorant on their part, but I think it's, it's just something that doesn't exist because what we do as writers, like I look at journalists and I know how to tell a story. I know how to tell a story that in the most compelling way possible. I don't know how to do that and keep the facts straight. Right, like to do that and have journalistic integrity seems bonkers to me, and so that's the like. So I look at journalists and I understand like, oh, you have the hardest job in the world, you know. When you look at like the fake news, like you know, being told, telling the New York Times they're fake news, when the New York Times is doing these crazy deep dive pieces while trying to not have bias and trying to do all these things, like that's an achievement, and I understand it's something that I can't do. And part of that is that I've worked for enough people who think they can do what I can do to understand, like, no, no, I can't do everything. There's people who are better at things. There's people who have skill sets that are specialized. And I think that editorial, specifically in comics, because it's so fan-driven, because I don't know, I'm, like, I'm, I'm reaching to try and find anybody I know who works professionally in comics who is not a comics fan. Right, because there's no reason. Right. Like, there's no reason to get into comics unless you were a huge fan at the beginning. So, because of that, everyone is like the the talent is tends to be treated badly. Like they tend to be kind of marginalized because of it, and you get lots of, 
you know, the, like the example I use is um, I wrote for iVampire, uh, the super fast version. His, the origin of Andrew Bennett, iVampire, he's a lord in 1700s. He falls in love with his chambermaid. They can't be together because he's a lord, she's a maid. One night, he's out in the woods, he gets turned into a vampire. He wakes up, he feels awesome. He's like, oh, this is fantastic. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. I'm gonna go turn Mary, my beloved chambermaid, also into a vampire. We can live together forever. He goes, he turns her into a vampire, she opens her eyes, and she is like, I hate everybody who has oppressed me for all of history. I will destroy mankind because of how they treated me. And so now he's like, fuck. <laughs> like, right? like, he now spends the rest of eternity trapped between I love you, I created you, and I have to destroy you. That is the concept of the book. So we, do, we had to do these zero issues, which are supposed to be their origin stories. And uh, the note I get from DC is, we don't want Mary in his origin. And I said to them, like, but that's his origin. Like, his origin is her. Like, there literally is no, like, his origin is he got bit by a vampire. And it was, like, a three-week-long standoff of me being like, guys, tell me what his origin is, because that's his origin. Like, that's his origin. It's in the books already. We've already explained it. It's already... And their argument, the argument they came back with is the book is not called We Vampire. It's called I Vampire. And you're like, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> and beyond that, like, you know, and again, like, you try to argue rationally, which is like, yeah, 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 him getting turned into a vampire is the least interesting part of the story. The interesting part is that he thought he was going to be with this woman forever. And instead, he turned her into a monster. Instead, he cursed her. And consequently, he is cursed. That's the interesting part. And their argument was like, but we don't want it to be a love story. And you just, you, and it was literally me being like, no, 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 listen, listen, this book that people love that you guys don't understand and didn't want to do, this is why people love it, is that's what it is. You know, and you, <coughs> you excuse me. and again, it's a thing where you have to be able to say, no, you have to be able to say no and understand that saying no means you'll get fired. <laughs> like that's, that's where it comes down to. Um, and what happened for me, you know, after the Green Lantern stuff, um, it became really clear to me that, you know, I'm bad, I'm bad at being apathetic. I'm bad at not being opinionated. Like I know what's right and what's wrong in my gut. Um, yeah, if you can hack it out, you could be there for a long time. No, and, and that's the thing is like, there's people, there's, there's a few guys who I know who've been in comics for 30 years or more, and they will tell stories of like, oh, and then they told me to do this, and I was like, that is the dumbest idea I ever had. And you're like, so what did you do? I'm like, well, I did it. And you're like, but your name's on that forever. Like, forever, you're the one who did that horrible, stupid story that, by the way, got erased, because it's a horrible, stupid story. Like, all people know is that you created this dumb thing that's out there. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, the mentality was always, like we were saying, you know, the, the whole unionization thing. Like, the mentality was always like, look, there's a 22-year-old standing outside. He'll take your job. And that was, that was their attitude. You know, when, when I left those two Green Lantern books, like, they replaced me within four hours. Like, there was no, there was no delay, you know. And, like, people knew why they were replacing me. And everyone was like, okay, we'll do it, <laughs> you know. So, like, and it was, the only reason Jon Stewart didn't get killed was corporate was like, what are you doing? We sell toys. Stop it. <laughs> you know, but like they were perfectly willing. There were people perfectly willing to walk up and do this, this thing that was literally detrimental to our industry that would have been bad for it our It would have industry. caused some feedback ever since yeah. the whole women in refrigerators thing, maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. 15 years ago, the outside world, not just us nerds, but the outside world has started to notice when, when women, when minorities, when gays, when certain characters get axed, mm -hmm. um, when they get treated shabby, that, that turns up. When it's, it's something that, you know, I, I think about a lot, the idea of representation. And, you know, like, I have a daughter, so that, that did it, right? Like, having a little girl and realizing, like, how few things there are that, I'm, that she can read that are positive and actually give her hope, you know, and, like, give me hope for who she's going to be is, is fairly limited. And so it's important for us as creators to understand that, like, imagine if she was, if my daughter was, you know, both black and female. So how do, like, where do I find the positive role models for her? Right. Where do we find those role models? Because we, we're lucky in that 
even being Jewish, like I had the thing, right? Like I could at least look, read Fantastic Four and be like, he's Jewish like me. But there's not, there weren't, there's not a lot of color, there's not a lot of characters who represent women. There's not a lot of characters who represent people of color. There's not a lot of people who represent people of non, you know, Christian and Jewish faith. Like there's not those characters. And that's, of everything that's happened in comics the past five years, like that's actually probably the best thing is that there are more comics for more people and they're getting wider and they're, they're sort of making the attempts to make them matter more. Um, but a lot of it is also kind of, a lot of it is driven by the people in Hollywood, strangely, for how much grief they're given. Like I, I know those people and I know that everyone's kind of wound up about how do we get more representation because if for like the most it's funny because it's it's the most callous reason possible, which is like, well, yeah, but if you know we launch Luke Cage, that's a whole audience who wouldn't go see our movies are now going to go see them because they want to see Luke Cage and things, you know. And it's like if that's what it takes to get them to invest in doing stories like that, that's fantastic. Yeah, when I see black kids trick or treating as Batman, or as I love Batman, I think that's fa I, that's great. I love it, but boy, talk about a maximum of affection for a minimum of effort. Mm -hmm. I mean. What has DC Comics ever done with the Batman franchise? Now, a couple things in the last ten years or so. A couple, a couple right. of things, in all fairness. But other than Lucius Fox, who is basically his business manager, right. um, uh, you know, it's it's despite the complete apathy of the publisher. Yeah. Um, before I ask anything else, you guys are nice enough to show up. Uh, our new friends. What questions do you have for Joshua? Go on. What do you have? Is it awkward? Now it's awkward. Uh, <laughs> you. <Yeah. laughs> I can just put you on the spot and say, think of something. Oh, I don't want to put you on the spot. I'm sorry. Thanks for coming. It's been awesome. Yeah. Uh, we didn't know we were going to be in town for this. We're a band on tour. Oh, right on. <laughs> oh, very cool. <laughs> What's your band? Uh, Molly Rhythm. Okay, cool. Oh, right on. Uh, I'm from Pittsburgh, so you're my native enemy. Stupid Sorry. Philly. Uh, guys. We've been playing at the Green Lantern tonight. Oh, yeah, that's just uh, wow. about 10 minutes from here. Uh, no hard no feelings. Awesome. <laughs> but you guys are only playing at the White Green Lantern, is what you're supposed yeah. to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the Green Lantern superhero, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, unless you're Green Lantern, you can't be in the Green Oh, if you only knew. <laughs> <laughs> that I had actually never heard the reasoning behind why you were taking off those books. And that I just it was just sitting here like, oh, of course. No, and, and it was like, I mean, I have a more. I live in California, I live in Los Angeles, I have a mortgage, I had a kid, my wife had just had cancer. Like, it was financially devastating. Like, it ruined us. But it was like, do you guys really, like, they just didn't, didn't want to hear it. You know? Right, so. Yeah. Um, Thank you. What inspired you to write the book? Um... It's probably me to write the bunker. Um, I tell a story. Okay, this is going to be deep. Get ready for it. So uh, when I was in college, I went to college in Boston, um, and on the I'd written a pilot with a buddy of mine, and we submitted it to, like, a contest online. And on the floor of graduation in, in, in June of 2000, uh, my cell phone rings, and I answer it, and it is this producer who is buying my pilot. Like, he was one of the guys, he did this contest, they're going to buy it, they're going to produce it. We spend the next, like, year working with this guy to, like, start pre-production and, like, get the money lined up, all this stuff. We're, like, working on it. Um, and uh, so finally he calls us and he says, get in your car. Uh, it's time to move to L.A. We're going to start pre-production properly. We're going to be shooting within three months. Uh, so my... Uh, ex-girlfriend and I get in the car. She was not my ex-girlfriend at the time. I just had to be, you know. Long drive. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we, we stop in New York, and she went to Stuyvesant High School, uh, which you might know as the high school right next to the World Trade Center. And we went to her high school, and we walked around, uh, and then we went to go stay with, like, you know, her, her grandpa or whatever. And uh, we got in our car uh, the next morning, and we drove, uh, we drove to Pittsburgh where my parents were. Um, and we pulled in at 2 in the morning on September 11th, 2001. And uh, woke up the next morning to see that the World Trade Center had fallen and would have fallen on our heads had we not left when we did. Um, over the course of like the next two weeks, essentially like the TV deal fell apart. All the plans I had just crumbled in front of me. And I was sort of like put with the question of like, well, what do you do? Because now I don't have a job. 
like we don't really have money because the money was going to come when we started working. Uh, but we were like, well, screw it. We'll go to L.A. anyways. I go to L.A. I'm with this girl for a few more years. Eventually we break up. Then I meet my wife. I get my wife and I get married. We have our kid. I start working in TV. Like I have this whole life that I get. But that all of that, had you gone back to me on September 9th, 2001 and said, hey, just so you know, None of that's going to happen. None of, the, none of the stuff you think is propelling you to leave Boston is going to happen and, in fact, is kind of going to ruin your life for the next, like, five years. I never would have left. I would have just stayed in Boston and, you know, I'd be running a movie theater. And, you know, it's not a bad job. Kind of sometimes it seems okay. You know, so the idea that, like, the, the path that I took to get here was hard and I made mistakes and bad things happened and good things happened, but they all got me to be me. They all got me into the position where I would meet my wife and where we would get married and where we would have a, our kid who's amazing um, and where I would get to work on you know, network TV shows and where I'd get to write Batman and Superman. Like All those things are because, because of that decision. But the idea of going back and like, what does it do? So what does it do if you find out that the path you're going on is not the path you think it's going to be? Um, and I think like all good... All good stories are kind of boilable. You can boil them down because when I tell you that story, I would guess everybody is thinking about what is that? What was that moment? What was the turn left moment, right? Where you had to decide between turning left and turning right, and you chose left. But man, had I turned right, I also tell because you guys are musicians. I'll do this one. I uh, <laughs> I, uh, I was working at a startup in college, and I was a, I was a singer songwriter back then. And uh, my phone rang, and it was a weird number, and I didn't answer it. And I forgot about it. And then the next morning, I like look at my phone. And there's a you know there's a voicemail, and it was uh, it was VH1. VH1 had uh, they were doing a documentary series where they were picking a singer songwriter to do a like mini documentary series followed by a tour opening for like. I don't think it was the old 97s because it was really old. It was this was I think before they existed, but someone liked the old 97s, like a decent mid level like a mid level kind of Americana band. And I was, like a, I was like a bluegrass punk band. It was like the sort of thing that I did. And uh, so I get this message where they're like, yeah, our guy dropped out and you were our next choice. And I'm like, holy crap. And so I immediately call them back and they're like, well, you didn't call us back. So we got your third choice. And again, it's like this weird tension point of like, wait, so I didn't answer my phone and I have a totally different life than I would have had. Um, and so I think like, that's at the heart of the bunker is knowing, knowing like if someone were to tell you this is the life that you were going to get, would you still be able to walk through that path? If someone was going to tell you like you had to walk barefoot through fire in order to get this thing, would you be able to do it knowing that it was going to hurt and knowing that it was going to scar you and make you who you were? So yeah, like that's the, that's the heart of it for me. How's that? How's that for an answer? That's, right? I don't know. I don't know. We were, I was good, though. It was like punk rock. It was like punk rock bluegrass. It's honest to God. So, you know. But, yeah. What did you write down? You wrote something down. Did you have something else? Did I wrote you? down The Bunker because I've not read it, and now I'd like to go buy it. I like That's that. That's what I wrote. I like that. So you, you, you We're making it. money left and right. We got new guys coming in. How you doing? Right this on. is Joshua Fialkov. Am I pronouncing Fialkov You're pretty right? close. It's Fialkov. Fialkov. It's Russian. It means beautiful flower. Should have put a. Uh, you guys are getting so much. There's so much value here. Do either of the other one of you have? I'm sorry. Oh, actually, that tells we're out of time. Yeah. Oh, well, it's wonderful. You guys well, stopped by. You paid Thanks 40 bucks on a whim to stop by Comic Con because you happen to be in town. Yeah. I'll be damned. You guys have CDs with you? I actually do have one of my. Box. Is there a Can merch a table by any chance? Do you in the sell back CDs? Do you come to my table and I'll trade you for something? I'll see you in a little bit. Awesome. That's a nice deal. I'm booth 100 or... Oh, okay. That's how we're here. Right on. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. nice. This turned out okay, right? Yeah. Yeah. I enjoyed meeting you. It's nice meeting you. I did uh, Starenko a couple years ago, and he was very intimidating, and I didn't... Oh, that dude's terrifying. Uh, yeah. It was an experience, but I, I don't know that I could say I enjoyed no, he's, it. he's, like, he's amazing. He's always on, and there's, you know... Well, and then he, he like, went full-on, like, super far-right crazy conspiracy on the internet. And it's even scarier. 
because you're I like, I wouldn't whoa, correct whoa, whoa. him if I were you. No, that's the thing. Like, people were like, people <laughs> were like what are you talking throat. about? Like, cause he's all about the deep state and like all that stuff. And you're like, I mean, the guy's kind of like a super spy, so maybe, but like, yeah, terrifying. The guy's, he's very nice and terrifying. He is. He's uh, as we were, as we were heading over to do his panel, he said. Here's the six things you have to say when you introduce me. And it was like number one, number two. And like number three, and I, of course I have a notebook usually, so happily I'm writing this down. Well, not happily, but I, I, I'm glad I had a notebook. And like number three, strangely, it was Wizard Magazine said I was the seventh most influential artist of the... I thought, really? That's what you want in your intro? <laughs> the I mean, you're Steranko. I mean, you know, screw Wizard. Yeah. I mean... Ah, oh, Jim Steranko. That's amazing. <laughs> I'll see you guys downstairs. Yeah, Thank you so much. Do you have more of these? Are yeah. you doing more of these? I'm doing Bo Smith next and then Mike Grell. Oh, right on. Mike Grell's awesome. Yeah. I don't know him. 